So we begin our series this evening with a guest speaker who has brought a unique perspective to his work in psychology and education at the University of Michigan, now for the better part of two decades. Um, a cultural psychologist who has worked on the very problematic issues of discrimination due to class, race, uh, caste, and gender, Ram Mahalingam has pioneered one of the country's first courses on mindfulness and social justice work. Uh, when I first met Ram, it was a delight to meet him and to discover that, in fact, he has a, like, uh, you know, it, we always say, those of us who keep bumping into people we know here in Rhode Island, that Rhode Island is a, you know, it's a small world. Um, so, in fact, uh, Ram, although he was born in South India, uh, spent a year studying at University of Rhode Island and actually came to the States initially to study ocean engineering. Uh, but he decided that was not his calling, uh, and he ended up uh, doing his PhD at the University of Pittsburgh in child psychology. Um, <clears throat> he has, uh, as I said, been for the better part of two decades a professor at University of Michigan, where he's established an enviable record of research in many areas of cross-cultural studies, including working with issues of caste in India and studying uh, janitors in the US, South Korea, and India. He's also been, as you will see if you go online, a beacon of support for undergraduate and graduate students, uh, helping them deal with uh, biases due to race, uh, ethnicity, and gender identity. So I am very pleased to welcome as our initial speaker for the Mindfulness Science and Society series, Professor Ram Mahalingam. Sorry, um, I want to thank you all coming on a Friday evening. You, have, you can do a lot of wonderful things on a Friday evening than listening to me on, about mindfulness and social justice. I just want to really thank you for coming and for Hal inviting me to start the speaker series where I really envy you all because all the speakers in the lineup, I've, some of them I know personally, some of them I don't know. I haven't met them, but you're going to see them. Please do attend all the talks. They are the top people whose work I admire a lot. And it's nice to see some old faces, some people. Brown stole from us, like Michael Kennedy, who's a dear friend from Michigan, to see him here. Um, so it's nice to be back here. So what I want to do is I want to give um, an introduction to the kind of work I do, since many of you are know about um, mindfulness, the basic research about this. I will not spend a lot of time on it. I want to go to the kind of work I do, which is different, at least you can learn from that. And a lot of my work came out of my own earlier work in India on caste system and female infanticide, I study female infanticide. So there is a very strong um, community-based research background I have, which is not typical for a psychologist. So when I'm a psychologist and you go to a grocery store, people think either I study rats or I'm a psychoanalyst. I neither, I don't do any one of them. So, so it's really nice to be here to really talk about what I do. So I de really developed a mindful, uh, mindfulness framework, which, which is very sensitive to the social issues I'm interested in. So I call it mindful mindset, a broader set of tools we need to have. Using the tools, I'm going to walk you through four lines of research I do. One is on general well-being, which is a lot of mindfulness research is about clinical work and well-being, which is important. Then I'm going to talk about how this is connected to look at connection to nature, larger connection, interconnection. Then I'm also going to talk about how this will affect us when we are also hyper-connected, because many of you are also checking your email now, busy. I also study cell phones, how people use cell phones, how hyper-connectivity can also, um, how mindfulness is also another way to think about hyper-connectivity. So I'll walk you through that. Then my last work is, last current work is on janitors, which is the current work, which is very hard. We just finished studying janitors in India. Uh, Korea and the US, South Korea. So you will see some of this work. So um, let me walk you through, then we'll have questions towards the end. Is it okay? Can you hear me well? Do you need me to increase? Okay, I'm not good with the mic, so. Okay, so basic definition, people have done a lot of work on mindfulness. It's an awareness and attention 
a lot of definitions. It's a mental process, psychological trait, specific meditative technique. So you can uh, develop, uh, you can also learn techniques. You become more mindful. People have looked at these questions. It's also, mindfulness also has a long tradition of focusing on the social issues. How the individual is also connected to different societies or different social groups. So for example, Dalai Lama's work, Sister Chen, Thich Nhat Hanh, Sharon Selber, Salzburg, whose work, and Mirabai Bush, who introduced us. Um, also doing this work where we also talk about the connection to the larger community, not just focus on developing yourself. Then we have work like Pat Gurin at University of Michigan. She studies integral processes where the empathy, how to dialogue, have a long semester long discussion on gender or race or sexualities, uh, Jewish Palestinian issues. So they really pursue this. So they all share these questions. Then within the mindfulness community, people like Greenberg, Purser really has the question. Uh, they distinguish between mindfulness and right mindfulness, where they talk mindfulness is not just about being in the moment or acquiring skills. Rather, it is about the ethics and practice of mindfulness and how to use it to really transform not only yourself, but also the communities you are part of. How to use it for transformation, both at the individual level and at the social level. So the how to connect this. So my work kind of interface between this. How to connect this for what? So I want to be a better mindful person for what? That's the next question for me. So I'm really in support of all the work, experimental work, some of the wonderful colleagues are doing it. It's very important for us, but I also want to take it to the next level, connect it to where we are going with that. So um, Rhonda Meggy, who is a very close friend of mine, she will be coming here next semester. She make sure you go to her talk. She calls it, she also does a lot of work on how to use mindfulness. She calls it color insight, which is also an important part of my work. So we share a lot of uh, things together. She uses mindfulness as a foundational support to teach for diversity. So my entire work started with my first teaching a course on mindfulness and leadership and creativity, where I talk about mindfulness, how to be a socially responsible way you can think about being a mindful leader in a community. Right? That's the course I teach. So um, Rhonda has been very uh, influential. So it really talks about how to use this mindfulness to talk about you increase concentration, which is important. You also increase awareness of condi conditioning, how constantly we use. For example, my early work was in essentialism. So when people essentialize, for example, if you go to um, anybody who works in a preschool, my first job in the US was a preschool teacher. I was a child psychologist. If you go to a preschool playground, what the thing you notice is that's probably the most essentialist place you can see. Boys will be playing on one side, girls will be playing on one side, and both will be very comfortable about stereotyping each other. So I don't want to play with boys, they have goodies, right? So, and of course, if you watch by three or four, there's also gender segregation who comes to birthday parties. Three-year-old birthday parties, girls will invite only girls. My daughter did that. But I was wishing that she could do it till she was 18. But it changed later when she was 18. So it's very important, really, how, this, uh, how you actually see this, how to counter the stereotypes the moment you catch it. Otherwise, we automatically process the information. People talk about it. Then how to do emotional regulation, then perspective taking and compassion, how to use mindfulness to ameliorate stereotype threat. There's a lot of interesting work coming on how mindfulness can help people to counter stereotype threat and the issue of trauma. Um, so this is very important work. So my work started with essentialism and power. That's what my early work was. My dissertation was looking at how children from upper caste and lower caste essentialize each other. So my theory was, if you come from a privileged community, you're more likely to essentialize your social identity. It's very comfortable for a man to say, if I give a statement like, boys are good at, uh, men are good at math than women because men are naturally good at math. So if I give the statement, more likely men are going to endorse this than women because it really solidifies men's position most of the time. So how essentialism really become an important part of how privilege, lack of privilege awareness tend to essentialize more. So you're likely to essentialize more. People have done experimental work on this. Many social psychological studies looking at this. My early work was also on that. From there, from essentialism, I moved to intersectionality. Krinsha's work was very important. Um, she really talks about how we should think about identity as intersectional. I should think of myself not only as a male, I'm also an immigrant, I'm also a professor, I'm also a father, how this identity simultaneously affect. They all come with very different privileges and marginalities. Sometimes we walk to my office, I know I'm a professor, people talk to me, 
But if I go to Sears, I have an accent. There are four people following me when I enter the Sears. My, my daughter says, Dad, they are racist. They are just following you because you are, you are a person of color. So the very context also changes what I'm, what I'm doing. So the privilege awareness is a very important part of work. So we found higher the privilege awareness that also they are likely to be more mindful. So we have looked at privilege awareness and mindfulness. Then we are also very influenced by Bell Hook's work on radical black subjectivity, where she talks about how capacity for critical resistance also need to have certain aesthetic element. That means uh, being mindful, being compassionate also is an important part to develop a resistance which also has an aesthetic component. Being a Buddhist scholar, she talks about that. So in my work, what I do is I really find the salutary effects of mindfulness has been very well documented. There are a lot of darker side too. People talk about it. So what I'm trying to see is how to bring mindfulness to really think about social justice. That's a gap in the, in the psychology literature, so I'm right to address that. So I develop an intersectional framework where I draw from intersectionality theory, social justice, and mindfulness. My intersectionality theory is also, I teach a gender psychology class. One of my former students is here, who took one of the very early, early part of the class he took with me. So we developed an intersectionality board game to teach how to use, how to understand intersectionality. So where really, uh, it was developed by one of my former students. And I think she was the first group we tested it. So she's here. So we really look at interconnectedness. So I'm moving from connecting mindfulness to interconnectedness. So I want to talk, I talk about interconnectedness at the intersectional level, at the social level, at all the an ecological level, our connection to larger nature, questions of nature, and now we are. So in Eastern, um, East Asian Buddhist tradition, connection to nature is a big point. So in Japan, it's very important how people talk about nature. Nature has, to, if you look at manga, any, any popular literature thing, spirit, the nature has spirits, trees have spirits, things like that. But you'll never see a representation like this in Indian Buddhist narratives. So Indian Buddhists are very much uh, focused on the uh, stories, not on the nature part of it. So in my uh, framework, I use these seven features I have. I call it mindful mindset, which is you have compassion, sympathetic joy, critical intersectional awareness, negative capability, cultural humility, wonder, and generosity. I'm going to walk you through why I think it's important. So hopefully, we can convince you. Then I have a scale to, of course, I need to have data to support to really convince you, qualitative or quantitative. You guys may be open to this. Um, but my colleagues want more quantitative. So you'll have a scale. You'll see the quantitative side. Then I'm going to talk about how to use it in my other work. Um, so people know a lot about compassion and sympathetic joy. So these are the features. So compassion is our ability to be respond to somebody's in pain or somebody is in stress. So how many of you know what sympathetic joy is? Probably since it's a contemporary studies program, everybody knows sympathetic joy is, right? What is sympathetic joy? Yes. <laughs> sympathetic joy, yeah, Punita, yes. What is it? It's the ability to um, feel joy when somebody else Right. So basically, you are responding. Compassion and sympathetic joy are twins of the same side. So I'm responding to something good happened to you versus something you are in stress. I'm responding to you. That's compassion. What we found was, even though both involve empathy and, and perspective taking, compassionate people, people are more compassionate, they are not necessarily high on sympathetic joy. For example, if Michael, is, Michael Kennedy is in stress, I'm more likely to call him, support him. But if he gets an award, I get an email, Michael got this award, my immediate reaction is, I have been working on the same topic. Why I didn't get the no nomination for the award? It's a very typical academic thing to do. Right? So that, the sympathetic joy is not there. I don't rejoice with him. Basically, it takes a while for me to overcome my jealousy to really respond to that. So we really work very hard on looking at how to cultivate sympathetic joy. So in my first early work in my class is how to help students to really think through this, uh, especially when you do all these social networks, social media. All the likes you get, I ask students, you make sure when you write, like somebody, don't say like. You also add, I'm inspired. The moment I say inspired, that means I'm rejoicing with you. I'm also learning from you. I cannot be jealous of you, but I'm inspired by you. This is true. So then the critical intersectional awareness, which is the idea that we have multiple identities. They're fluid. They're situational, which is very common. Which if you look at critical theory and feminist <coughs> research, you can say very common, most common uh, definition. I also found Yuval Davis' work on situated intersectionalities and belonging. She writes a lot about belonging. She studies immigrants. Being self-reflective self -reflective about our own positioning, that means I need to understand who I am, but also you root that experience to shift and understand the other person, right? 
So then by, she talks about feminist epistemology that is situated knowledge to a notion of situated imagination. That is, you understand your own experience deeply, also try to use it to understand the other. What we call, uh, what she calls the caring, at the same time also, uh, imagine, if you're able to imagine the other, that's important. Negative capability is an important construct which is very, it was, how many of you know what it is before I go? Some of you know about this, some literature people. It was originally wrote by Keats, the, uh, the um, poet, the, um, the romantics poet. So he wrote a letter to their brother, negative capability is the capacity to reside in situations where being open mind to, to, to a situation that is even difficult for you to follow. So as an artist, if I'm writing a script, the script leads me to some place, I need to follow the truth, however uncomfortable I am with this. So negative capability, Still, so much interest, there are thousands of papers in organizational psychology about and leadership on negative capability. So having neg negative capability is a good thing because you are able to deal with emotions that are difficult for us to be with. So how, to how to pursue that with the open mind? So T.S. Eliot was very inspired by that. He also calls it a self -sacrifice. you need a self-sacrifice to be fully present in the moment, being open. It's an extension of his or her personality. So basically, you suspend your ego, which is an important part of his argument, and how to do this, and how it's also very compatible with the way how we think about mindfulness and open, being open. So this is one of the uh, early research on negative capability in uh, Carnish, done a lot of work on this. this. is one of the very nice paper he wrote about how being open, you attend to diversity and suspension of ego. This is the, these are the hallmarks of being a person who has a high negative capability. So any researcher needs to have this because if I'm going to study uh, immigrants, I need to go and there are times they're going to talk about something about the community, which I'm part of, but I need to be very uh, non-judgmental, be open, and also listen to them carefully. Cultural humility, which is another major topic, looking at how we are going to learn from the other person who is different. It's basically an awareness. We are constantly looking at my own, my own privileges when I'm, and prejudices with which I'm going to learn from the other person have an awareness of it. How, stay with that particular notion, being open, and how you're gonna appreciate others with the recognition that they have a pal something positive I learn from them. Basically, when you are inspired from somebody, you are actually going to learn from them. So this idea of cultural humility is a very big topic in, uh, in social work, when you're going to do interventions, so you need to understand the other community. So you go there, not with cultural competence, but with cultural humility. You go there to learn from them, so you need to be really, grounded with that. Wonder is accepting others who are different because you also have a mystical element attached to this, something different. But I'm not exoticizing, but at the same time trying to understand the other. So wonder is uh, about mysteries. This is Sandra Lenz, who is a colleague of mine. He studies wonder at workplace. So wonder also revolved, involves about recognizing, recognizing others' difference. What is finding something familiar in, in a very unfamiliar situation? So that you need to be open to be in the present. So like the beginner's mind, one way to think about beginner's mind is to provide you the foundation to be open, to understand the other. So all these things, look at people who are different, so how to think about that. Then generosity, of course, generosity is involved. So when you think of generosity, what comes to your mind? When you think of generosity as an important part. Yes. Generosity typically we associate with giving money, correct? But generosity is also involved in very complex ways. I text my students every day for six weeks to really follow the generous acts around them. And I give a very detailed template how to do this. Generosity does not involve always money. It's always sometime involve money. But a lot of times it is about when I'm in trouble, I call a friend who talks to me for an hour that they are emotionally generous to me. And people like Mike advertised my talk all over the place. He was very generous with his time talking about my work and put it in Facebook. So there is intellectual generosity. Then I look at generosity as the vulnerable. It's in, in Tibetan Buddhism, it's called Jinpa. So as a leader, you're vulnerable, but you use it to understand the other and how to see that. So I text students every day to monitor the generosity around them. So I cannot ask my students to be generous, but I ask my students to notice generosity. The more they notice, they become more generous by the end of six weeks. So we have a text-based intervention study which is an um, important part of my early work, developing the idea. So use this um, mindful mindset, I have four lines of work. First, I'm going to show you how it predicts well-being, all the other usual stuff we expect 
the, what we call the first order suffering, how mindful mindset can help you. Second, I'm going to use this to really, what are the specific minority groups we studied, Asian American and discrimination, and LGBT people of color, we did a study on this. Then I'm going to talk about the other connection to nature and hyper-connected self, and come to end the talk with the janitors. So first study we did was, it's a, a study where we really looked at authentic self and well-being. We looked at how mindful mindset can help you, um, how it mediates. Authentic self is defined by Sonia Luther as uh, one of my colleague, colleagues and friends. She studies authentic self as the congruence between ideals and an actual self. The more closer the distance between your actual and ideal self, that means you're accepting yourself more, which is an important part. So the, the, long, the larger the distance between this ideal and actual self, so you have more high anxiety, high depression, all those clinical work she has done before. So we use the scale to look at it. So what we found was the, the higher the authentic self, you're also higher in mindful mindset. It also mediates the relationship between mind, uh, authentic self and perceived stress. The more, the, the more it is, more closer you are, you have less stress, or the more the distance between your ideal and actual self, you are in a lot of stress, because you need to live. So for example, if I think my ideal, say I should have lost 110 pounds, and maybe four inches taller than I am now, because your height predicts your income, 10% of your income, which is always an important thing, but I don't have any control over it. But if I try to do it, then I'm going to be less, more stressed out about it and I do all these things. Then the second thing is we also looked at authentic self and well-being. Um, we also found the same relationship, same figure you see. In the second study, we look at subjective vitality, which is another positive psychology measure widely used in positive psychology. So we find if you have pursued stress and depression, mindful mindset mediates that. We also found, um, then we are, the next question was students asked how to subject to vitality. The next question was how to get it, right? How to be more mindful. So, <clears throat> of course, if you go to a Buddhist monastery, if you meditate for six months, you'll be more mindful, but I cannot ask my students to do that. So being an American pragmatist, I developed a mobile app, which just they use it for 10 minutes a day, that'll help them to be more mindful. So what we did was we did a mindful intervention study with the grad students who are at a lot of stress, who has a very high social comparison. Oh my God, he, she went to four conferences, I only went to two, you got the fellowship. So it's very high. So we decided to do an intervention study. For three weeks, we asked them to use the mobile app. We also texted them every day to remind them to do it. It's a 15 minutes where they will be monitoring all the dimensions we talked about, and the app will plot it for them. They'll show how they're progressing. The feedback helps them to really think about what areas they need to work on. So it, we did for three weeks with the study. So what we expected was it's going to increase the scores. First of all, we found after three weeks, their mindful mind score, mindset score increased significantly. Just using 10 minutes, they are not meditating, nothing. Just the app was helpful to them for this particular group. We also found whether the mindful mindset score can help them have a, is it predicting a lower scores in social comparison? Whether the social comparison went down. The more they accept themselves, they did that. So we found the same thing. We also find it really, sorry. So the, there was a significant inter increase in the scores. That means the intervention worked well. It also, a three weeks predict higher ratings of authentic self because you also see you accept yourself more. You have larger congruence between ideal self and the, and the real self. We had, we had a lot more um, congruence and ro low ratings of social comparison, which is a very important. And also it predicted well-being, which we already replicated in our previous studies. So the, we developed this app for the, uh, using iPhone, so we are going to release it in a couple of months for the other platform. We only developed it for the research, but it was very helpful to do this work. Then we also did this, test the scale after three weeks, do the test, retest reliability, which is one way of testing whether the scale has a, uh, is reliable over time. So in, internal consistency is 0.84 to 0.92, the reliability is 0.87. These are all pretty decent, uh, decent to good um, scores. The second set of studies, we looked at discrimination. So here we looked at um, marginalized communities, look at mindful mindset, with that, uh, using this scale with that in the community. So because if you look at most of the research on mindfulness is with the work, work with white, white middle, middle class sample. Very few studies are with people of color. Leave alone Asian Americans. Very few studies report, about, report their experience. So we really wanted to focus on um, two subgroups. One is Asian American studies. This is uh, Amy Ko, who is my PhD student. It's one of her study. So she wanted to check whether Mindful mindset really helps them to cope with the discrimination. 
So she really looked at the mindful mindset, the relationship between mindful mindset and um, coping, right, and discrimination. It's primarily East Asian sample, 443. This is one of the chapters for her dissertation. What we found was there was a moderating effect of mindful mindset. The higher mindful mindset really helps you to cope with internalizing discrimination, perceived stress, and drugs and alcohol and perceived stress. For example, one of the measures about uh, discrimination is if you're discriminated, you're under a lot of stress, you're also more likely to use alcohol to really cope with it. So if you're highly, if you're high and mindful, you're less likely to do that. So it's really an interesting way to think about it. So we can actually think of an intervention now. The next step, we can actually see whether it helps them to cope with it. So next study was done by Brandon Valentine, who's a professor now in Mills College, my former student. So he did this study in a, he went to Adodi, which is an African-American um, LGBT support group. It was started in the 70s, been, been for a long time, late 80s, I'm sorry, where they were supporting uh, African-American men with HIV positive a support, spiritual support group. Every year, they, re they do a retreat, and he went to the retreat. He did a study there. He also did a interviews with them. We want to see whether the mindful mindset scale, how it works in that particular community. That's the first study he did. So we found mindful mindset was positive related to emotional reappraisal, which is better strategy for emotional regulation. There are two strategies in emotional regulation people study. One is reappraisal, how you can rethink your emotions, or suppression. You can suppress your emotions. The suppression is the negative emotion because you don't want to deal with it. That means you don't deal with it. Whereas reappraisal is you reframe your experience, how to think about it. So we found mindful mindset was very positive related to reappraisal. It was also negatively related to workplace heterosexism. So it's really uh, an important piece. Then he took it and did a larger study with the uh, LGBT sample of 221, 29, mostly uh, people of color. So it's very few studies. We have people of color and mindfulness. So this is his first study. It's under review now. We almost got it in press in a couple of months. Next month, it'll be in press. We are almost done with the revision, so it's a good paper. Then the next question was, I was interested in the ecological question. To what extent mindfulness is about connected to nature, the larger sense of self, how it is interconnected. So most of the, it's a very big topic, connection to nature in, um, in environmental studies, where you, um, people who score very high on connection to nature, for example, you can think of yourself as part of the larger world. You really see the trees and animals as part of our, um, our world. You really have a kinship relationship with them. The way you think about this relationship, how do you think about connection to nature, the higher the scores, they really predict sustainable behavior. People who score high in connection to nature are also more likely to recycle. They're also more likely to um, engage in sustainable behavior, right? All the sustainable environmental behavior. They're also very high on um, environmental motives to save nature, all kind of good things we expect. So what we did was we did a mindful, mindful mindset, how it is connect, connection to nature study, where we did a 270, the MTurk study. So we, did, we want to look at how MS was related to connection to nature scale. So whether it is mediated the relationship between attitudes and behavior, because that's a very big thing. So, OK, that's a big thing. The, So this is the, so mindful mindset really mediate the relationship. The higher uh, connection to nature score, you're also um, pro-environmental attitude, which also predicted behavior. So in a way, this also really has a validity. In a way, we can think of connection to nature as part of the, the work we are doing. So that's another lay, way of thinking about connecting uh, larger environmental questions and environmental justice questions. The next line of work my students are interested in looking at environmental justice and mindfulness. So we also want to know whether anything else other than mindfulness or what are the ways we can also help students to cultivate um, connection to nature. So what we did was uh, one of my close friends is also a scholar, Shakuhachi scholar. How many of you know what Shakuhachi is? Probably some of you know. You know, right? Shakuhachi is a, is a Japanese flute. So if you watch any old Kurosawa movies, the opening shot will have the Shakuhachi. You see the very soulful flute. The, you can see he's very fond of that. It's a very difficult instrument to play. You play it more like a trumpet. You keep it like this. It's a very difficult instrument. Um, Koji Matsunabu is a, 
a friend of mine who is also a professor of musicology. He came to Michigan for my mindfulness class. He did a five-day workshop on shakakashi. He brought 25 shakakashis to students. So every day we practiced for two hours for five days. We also gave them shakakashis to take it home. So they practiced. It's a very difficult instrument to learn, but they did it. So what we did was we wanted to see whether the idea of the, the goal of shakakashi is when you play the shakakashi, which is played by mostly by Zen monks. So the goal is to cultivate a sense of self that is connected to nature. So when you play the flute, you become the flute. So that's really how to connect, how to really cultivate a sense of self, cultivation of self that's connected to a larger sense of uh, larger nature, right? That's really the main uh, goal of this. So we really taught them the philosophy. They, we also, they also practice. Basically, it is more a meditative technique. If you don't like um, to meditate, shakra will be a good thing. But Koji will also say, if you don't like shakra you can take your beer bottle. You can do the same thing. You can blow it properly. He taught them how to do it too. So we did that. So as an alternate, if you don't like shakra you can take the beer bottle. You can do this. So both will work fine, as long as you don't make sure that you don't pass out. That's the only thing you have to be careful about. And depending on whether you blow the beer bottle before or after you drink when you're using it. So they brought it to the class. So, so what we found was we did a significant increase in the post-test course after the five-day workshop. So what I'm saying is there are different ways we can also cultivate mindfulness. There are also culturally meaningful and personally meaningful. If you're inter musically talented, this is another way to think about it. If you don't like to sit for meditation, we can use it as an intervention. You can practice it. You can also have a, a, a mindset which helps you to really practice it with a way you can actually feel connected. And that's really, we found really quite an interesting group of students. People really liked it very much. Then, of course, the next is I'm going to go move to the hyper-connected self. Here it is my work on cell phones. So we all know cell phone is a major theme. Everybody uses cell phones. For a very long time, I didn't use cell phones because I was not interested in carrying one. So, but my daughter was in high school, so I have to buy the phone so that they can pick them up, all kind of stuff parents do. So if you look at impact of mobile phones on social ties, there are two camps. One camp says mobile phones are bad for us. So people are not talking to each other. They are actually texting. They are not talking in the you know, families don't have conversation. It really severe ties. Then the other group like, you know, Wellman, his, his question is, Barry Wellman is, he's, oh, it really increased social ties. So you are talking to more people. You are talking to somebody in China, and it's really helpful. So we have, a, you know, one camp says it's really bad for us. The other camp says it's really not good. So, so the question is, people are looking at how it is also useful. Some psychologists look at youth development also looks at relationship. For example, you also expect it to, it depends on the culture. For example, in India, if you text, within two hours, you have to respond to the text. Otherwise, there'll be more texts, right? In Korea, I think it's even one hour. If you don't get this, then, so, then my student will text me again. So I texted you already. Did you get my text? Which is in 45 minutes, another time. So, so the, there is the expectation, the relationship maintenance, so that it's mediated by the cell phones. Not only that, it also changes your social relationships. For example, one of the famous social psychology experiments where they brought people to a lab. They just left a cell phone, which is not even switched on in one condition. The other condition, there was no cell phone. Then asked people to work in a pair. They found in a cell phone condition, people, the social interaction, quality of social interaction went down. Just having the presence of a cell phone itself changes. So I, I'm, by looking at the phone, I think I could call somebody, even though I'm not calling them. It really affects the nature of social relationships. So it also leads to people study problematic use of mobile phones. They call it problematic use of mobile phones because you can do a lot of good things with mobile phones because I, can, I have my mobile app in the phone. Then I can also learn a language, things like that. But at the same time, mobile phones also, people who watch pornography, you can also gambling. Gambling addiction is pretty high after the mobile phone. People are looking at the problematic use of mobile phone, especially for gambling, especially young people. Um, so I really identify three different kinds of cell phone and self, right? Is cell phone and self, I call them self because there is a hybrid, because it is a relationship I'm studying. The relationship is uh, three kinds of modes. One is the empowering self. Basically, you can use it for good things. You can check where your daughter is. If you are in emergency, they can call you. And it's also expressive. So you can, I, can, I can send texts and I can talk to people. 
what I call enfeebling self. That's where you are depressed when you watch. You know, I, when I get an email from my friends in Hawaii, they post in January, 75 degrees, they are in the beach. I'm in Michigan sitting in my office. It's minus 14 outside, so the snow is not melting. We didn't see sun in a while. So it's really very depressing to see it. So you really do social comparison. So I developed a scale, three scales to look at empowering self. How this, I have, I'm working on a book. I'm looking at how these three modes of self emerge and how people manage them. So my question was, can mindful use of cell phones will be helpful? In fact, I have a lecture on how to do mindful texting. That was the second lecture in my, in my mindfulness class. So we talked about this. So here we did the study where we actually looked at whether mindful uh, and feeble self and stress, basically the more you are, you are connected. So the, the more you're high on this, you're also high on stress. But mindful mindset actually mediates this. Basically, my point is whether, mindful, whether cell phones are good or bad, it depends. And how consciously you are aware of how you're using it, how mindful you are, you can actually mit mitigate the negative effects of it. Otherwise, you can also get into the spiral, which leads to a lot of stress. There are a lot of work on mobile phone addiction that really looks at these kind of questions. So the last uh, study I want to talk about is the question of, it's, it's about workplace. I'm looking at mindful mindset and dignity and invisibility. So this is where most of my current work is looking at um, how people are, um, how to think about dignity in workplace in three different cultures, right? So um, I'm interested in janitors because in India, most of the janitors come from the Dalit community who are formerly treated as untouchables. So it's really a very strong caste and class question there. Whereas in, in, in the US, it is the most integrated workforce. We are studying um, janitors in the University of Michigan. Half of them are people of color. There's no other workforce you can actually see such an integrated workforce. It's a very wide range of uh, ethnic groups. Um, South Korea, it's a very interesting situation where about 90% of the janitors are women. They are middle-aged women. So each has a location has a different kind of issues. One is gender, other one is caste here, race, ethnicity, and class. So with this, we are looking at dignity in workplace. This is Besda Wilson, who won the Magasai. He, from India, Magasai Award from Philippines. He liberated, literally liberated 100,000 people who did manual scavenging in India. He really had a national campaign. He worked to liberate them. So he was awarded. So he, the, the whole purpose of the work was the dignity, how human dignity is important. That's the core of his campaign, how he worked on it. So dignity and mistreatment has been studied by sociologists for a very long time, but psychologists don't have any clue how to think about it. So we don't have you. We study self-esteem, which is very different from um, dignity, because dignity has a social component. It is also a, uh, interactional. So we are looking at dignity and mistreatment. Hudson's work on labor, a lot of labor organizing work really revolved around dignity of labor. It's important. Then people like Sharon Bolton talks about dignity in and dignity at work. So in dignity in work, what she calls is some, um, there is, when you work, you also need an opportunity to grow in your work. So you really become more qualified. The opportunity should be there to gain dignity at workplace. And there should be dignity of work itself. So it's really distinguished how these two really kind of a labor orientation, institutional practices changes. Then, of course, all labor has dignity is a famous uh, lecture. The last uh, Martin Luther King when he went, he was in Memphis uh, street cleaners, Mem Memphis sanitation workers strike. That was Martin Luther King's last lecture, all labor has dignity. And he also got the, um, he would give the honorary union membership the night before he was shot. So, and this, so it's a very important book. If you have, uh, it's a very important book. He talks about labor and, and dignity and race and class for the first time when you think about it together. Then the people look at dignity injuries, how certain practices in workplace can cause dignity injuries. Ah, sorry. So, so the famous quote is, this is my famous quote, for urban life means your shit is not your problem because it's somebody else. So most of the time, the cleaning is done by the most marginalized community in India and Korea, as well as in the US, to different degrees. So in these three countries, we, we looked at field-based observations, interviews, and survey. We focus on disrespect and invisibility of workplace. So people are not visible. For example, janitors are invisible because nobody pays attention to them. So if you watch any movie, any action movie, if the hero is chased by bad guys, he always comes out in a janitor dress. He'll be, nobody notices him. 
He doesn't even change his face. So there is a certain amount that labor is invisible in workplace. How the invisibility affect their motivation to be work in, in, the, in the workplace motivation? How they think of meaning at work? We looked at that. So in the US, it's the most integrated workforce in South Korea. As I told you before, the majority are women. So the Dalit castes are doing this. So first study, we, this is the preliminary findings. What we found was disrespect and invisibility were negatively related to mindful mindset. The more disrespect people are feeling, it also affects their capacity to be mindful because you're constantly objectified. You also have to deal with this sort of a, uh, what we call both incivility in workplace and invisibility in workplace. So we studied the incivility, how people are incivil to you. So it really affects your capacity to be mindful, to be in the present, how to help that. In South Korea, we also found mindful mindset was negatively related to stress in workplace. But here the question was class. They really talk about the class consciousness, how people treat them. There are professors who won't be with them in the same elevator. In the interviews, they talked about this, how they are seen. But at the same time, the unionization of the um, South Korean workers, which happened about 2000, Jennifer Chun is a wonderful sociologist from Uni University of Toronto, wrote a book on this. What she found was how they use union organized it and how dignity was the major part of the campaign, right? Then they found they also negotiated a lot of things for them. In a sense, each building has a place where they can cook and they can actually talk to students. Each university building gave a special place for them to rest and they can cook. The students go and meet with them. It's not, it, I don't think it's happening in Michigan. I don't know what the situation here. In fact, in Michigan, the janitor schedule is probably the worst time, from 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. That's their normal work schedule. Whether you have a mother, young mother, children, I don't know what this arrangement in Brown is. So usually they come in the evening, they work till midnight. Whereas in both in India and there, they really work in a regular time, from 8 to 4. That's the regular schedule. So we found uh, how the, in Indian context, we looked at disaster management. There was a flood in 2015, December, how the sanitation workers were treated. There's so much money went from, in, from the US to help the flood victims. But they didn't say do anything for the janitors because all the janitors from the caste and they were treated miserably. So we followed all these stories, what happened to them and how they documented it. So what we found, the, how the dirty work and the Dalit caste status naturalized their suffering. People said, oh, that's what they've been doing. So they didn't pay attention to them. How the dignity injury, injuries are also invisible and how they have to use media and intellectuals from Dalit community have to talk about how to prevent these um, injuries, right? So it's really, we are looking at how the disaster management never has to pay attention to the, uh, how the sufferings of these people who are actually doing the cleaning because none of the volunteers want to clean the city, but they were there to distribute the food. But all the cleaning were done by the janitors who are Dalits, 90% of them. So we also look at how these mindful mindset and workplace practices are important to really look at it. So for example, in the US, there is a new system called OS1. That's a new liberal policy where janitors used to be like, for example, each floor has a janitor. The janitors will, so let's say they'll be doing one wing, other janitor will be other doing other wing. Now, the OS1 system really changed this. So you'll be doing, one janitor will be doing all the uh, vacuuming. Other janitor will do all the cleaning of the toilet. One janitor will do the wash all the mirrors in the bathroom. It's very tailored to specific tasks. That means, in a way, it's a very Fordian model of division of labor, so the labor can be replaceable. So what happens is janitors with 20 years of experience feel like treated like children. The OS1 system is a major issue, so it's, it's, we didn't know anything about it when we started this. We talked about dignity and how the workplace doesn't pay attention to this. So we, how the larger structural forces also can undermine the dignity of worker in this place. That's the so in South Korea, again, being a gender, intersection of gender and class status also affect how people treat janitors. So in India, it's about the caste status and naturalization of caste. Ah. So in, in, the, in my research, we looked at mindful mindset and well-being, connection to nature, pro-environmental behavior, and also look at uh, connection to uh, and cell phone use, stress and discrimination, dignity, and authentic self. This is sort of a, this is a broader picture of what I do with among these four lines of work. So in conclusion, what I want to say is it provides, a, we need an interdisciplinary perspective. We need to bring perspectives that are very elements of uh, 
social justice framework like privilege awareness, intersectionality, negative capability, cultural humility, and wonder to mindfulness research by infusing them with these ideas. So we were able to really look at the questions that is meaningful to the communities we are studying. In a way, mindfulness has something to offer to social justice, not just, just the development of yourself, how to you expand your self-awareness to the communities and how we can be part of it. So I need to really acknowledge all the people who are my community, my students and my former students, collaborators now, they are faculty members, who really, who's without them, I would not have done everything what I did. So this is my interconnection to them. So I want to thank all of them to be with me. And I'm going to stop here so we can have questions and specific things you want me to go over. I'll be happy to do that. Thank you. Yes, hello. Okay, sure. So intersectionality is defined as, um, as the sense that we have multiple identities. Not only we have multiple identities, the identities also come with different marginalities and privileges. And having an awareness of our own privileges and marginal status help us to understand our own identities in relation to each other. So if I cannot, if I'm going to study race, I need to study race and gender in relation to class, things like that. So the intersectionality framework really pushes us to think about the question of multiple identities, how multiple modes of oppression, how it affects people. So the intersectionality framework uh, originally developed by Crenshaw, Kimberly Crenshaw who's a legal scholar who really pushes these arguments. So really uh, how, do, how there are multiple forms of oppression because you're embodying different identities. In my own research, I study intersectionality in three different ways. One is focusing on the multiple identities embodied by the person. So if you are being a LGBTQ working class, how it affects the sense of um, yourself and yes, discrimination, things like that. But you can also look at uh, intersectionality as an awareness to what extent you are aware that you have multiple identities. So for example, in my mindfulness class, by the time they finish, they really think, oh my God, there is, oh, I have multiple identities. I need to think of self is changing. So that itself becomes an outcome for the study. Then um, you can also think of intersecting context, the particular context and immigrant status has a particular way of thinking about who you are. So all these different ways also looking at context and identity in relation to social structures. It's very sociological in that sense. It's very difficult for psychologists. That's why we have to develop a board game to teach them how to think about it. So, yes. we have done it. Well, the, let me brief, briefly talk about the board game, what the board game does. That's an intervention we did. Then we can talk about the epistemological question you are, you are raising. The board game is basically, it's more like a monopoly. So we have different character cards. So we really give different intersecting identities. If you're going to play, we'll give you the card. You have to write a narrative about who you are based on the description. So people come up with a story. So first time I asked the students to do it, they were like, not very much into it, so we have to really, so how to come up with a narrative. Of course, then I have to, being a farmer, I also teach a film class. I told them, this is the story, you're going to audition for my film, so you're going to write a story for the character. The moment you say they really write a very detailed narrative about who this person is, the, the driver is from Russia, but he has a PhD in biochemistry, but he couldn't get a job. So they really come up with a very interesting narrative. So when you play the game, the game, then there's a chance card. The chance card has all the description all the microaggressions experienced by people with different marginalized identities. 
So it will stop and so they will realize anybody who is embodying the identity will go two steps backward, things like that. So the board, is, board game is called American Dream. It has a picket fence in the end. So whoever is going to the picket fence house, they win the game. So whoever has, usually the game is, who has the most privileged identity will move fast in the game. That's as simple, simple as that. So then all of a sudden they realize this game is how it is done, then they discuss about the experiences. Then they talk about, oh, I know a friend who did this. So basically, you give them a, a, a venue to think about this question without really saying, I understand you, but you also need to process it, what it means. Because it could not be your identity. That's the only rule for the game. So you cannot be a white person if you're going to play this game. So there are white character, you cannot have it. So same identity will not have. That's the only thing. Second thing is, when you try to understand the, um, how to understand the other person. So narratives are very helpful. So you're actually write a narrative. And what are the rules of the narrative? How to think about present your work? So that really helps students to understand. So that the, we don't get into the part, oh, I can really understand right away. So it really, how the processing works. So some of the IGR principles are very helpful to really think about how to intergroup processes. So you actually understand the empathy. You go through stages of understanding. Even your awareness increases over time. For example, a lot of students first level, they understand, oh, I have multiple identities. That's interesting. Then some people think, oh, multiple identities, oh, people have different privileges come with it. Then the third level, they really think, how to use these privileges to form um, uh, ally behavior, how to form coalition, how can I reach out? So they really discuss it. What are the limitations? How, how I can do it? What are the real challenges? So, that's, so we can actually experience learning, plus you also process it differently help them through that. Yes? This lecture reminds me of one of the reasons why Michigan was such a wonderful place, and that was because you were there. And, <laughs> and, but also to have this dialogue between sociology and psychology right. is, is invaluable. And I never thought in these terms before, and so I'm very grateful, and I need to ask you to elaborate. And sure. it's this. To think about the mindfulness associated with those who have more marked intersectionality than those who have a, uh, an identity that's more conventionally associated with privilege. Right. If your intersectionality means that you're being disrespected, if you're being denied dignity, you have more barriers right. to create this, right. if I understand the work on the gender. Right. 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 On the other hand, one of the things Du Bois and all of that subsequent work suggests is that people who live on the other side of the veil are more aware of Correct. the multidimensionality of right. life than those like me Correct. who live in the right. land of privilege. Right. So how does mindfulness articulate with these different dimensions of intersectionality, both in terms of privileged life, but also diminished awareness? I think there is two. The, the question is very interesting. When we did this janitor study, the first round of studies we did, um, so we were expecting, we found uh, we have an invisibility, measure of invisibility, how invisible you are in workplace. What was surprising was white custodians claimed high invisibility in workplace, like you said, because they are not used to this invisibility. Whereas when you talk to the people of color, they are like, oh, we have been invisible for a long time, uh, uh, among other dimensions, being a person of color, women, all kind of stuff. So there is a way, particularly they realize, oh my God, I'm invisible because this particular domain, I don't have the privileged status. So that itself is very helpful to really think through this. So the privilege awareness, what happens with the um, privilege awareness work is, it really leads to more, um, at least in psychological research, the privilege awareness also associated with suppression and guilt. That doesn't translate, translate into action. So whereas mindfulness and negative capability will help us you walk through this without judging, being open. It's okay, you're privileged, but you have to stay with that. How to help students to stay with that emotion is very important. And where, that's where we need to have people, ideas like negative capability will be helpful to really be, think through this in a creatively, how to think about it. Not having after effect of being judgmental about, oh, I have privilege, I'm stressed out about it, or I don't want to talk about it. Oh, I'm born with it, what am I supposed to do? So that's really questions don't really take you anywhere. So we help the students to process it differently. So mindfulness will be a very important role in helping students to process it. IGR does it in a different way, but this is another way to think about it. Yes? Uh, I'm a little concerned about, you know, the, 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 well, 
whether you're really measuring mindfulness or certain, just certain aspects of it. Uh, I said because you can be calm, mm -hmm. but at the same time, not mindful. That's right. You can be intersectional, right. but not mindful. Uh, you can be compassionate, but not mindful. In other words, you can stay within your normal egocentric framework and be all of those things I just mentioned. The way I understand mindfulness, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert on mindfulness. Uh, you, it, it seems to me that you want uh, certain qualities like calmness, like compassion, etc., etc. After you have attained a certain level of ego transcendence, that, uh, in other words, to me, mindfulness brings heightened sense of calmness, heightened sense of empathy, heightened sense of intersectionality. Uh, you know, and so I, I wasn't convinced that you weren't capturing, you know, egocentric calmness, egocentric empathy. So you gotta convince me that in these measurements, you were really capturing people who had experienced a certain level of ego transcendence. Because they really think that if you don't get that, then to me what is distinctive about the concept of mindfulness escapes the, 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 the methodology. Uh, it's a good question. Um, it's a very multidimensional construct, mindfulness is. So it's really not one, one measure is going to capture it. Um, it's also a process that people are going to acquire over time. So the scale really brings all these dimensions together so that it can actually help you to think through the questions that will come up in the social justice work. So that's really, it's pretty much come, came from the gr ground up, so what my experience was. So um, you are right, people have to different degree of expertise they're going to gain over time. So, but I see them all go together, it's a holistic. As a, I was a meditation teacher when I was 19, I got certified. From there I've been doing it. So I really don't see one piece is going to lead to other. I really see them as go together as a holistic. I really think it's a holistic intervention that way. Um, you're right. If you want to do mindfulness, whether you reach this stage, when that lead to other levels of consciousness, that's a different empirical question. I don't have data to answer that. So it's the beginning of my work where I'm actually looking at this, how it changes over time. What are the ways we can help students have the tools to think through this? That's the stage I am. Maybe in another 10 years, I'll have a better answer for your question. Yeah, I think it's the two issues. Oh, yeah, you're right. Uh, thank you for your comment. Um, so at the same time, Buddhism does not alone have monopoly over social justice or other questions, compassion also. It's been some, a lot of work has been done here. So I'm trying to integrate them in that way. We can have all these, the, the issues can come together. Some overlap, something new, so we can also bring them together. Um, it's, um, the, the, my, my interest in research on the topic when I started studying mindfulness was psychologists mostly focused on the individual. That was really a big issue. And we don't have much to say about the question of how to think about communities and how to do this, even though it's a very central to the Buddhist. The secularization of mindfulness has certain drawbacks. One of them was not to talk about the communities explicitly in the training, which I'm trying to do. I also try to provide tools for the students to think through this. That's, that's how I see this, all the pieces are. Yes. Uh, kind of a bit of that question. Have you seen uh, yourself maybe as a proponent of using mindfulness in a social justice 
uh, framework. How can we maybe reframe the popular conversation on what is mindfulness from that kind of self, uh, self-help directly, right. uh, direction to uh, more outward and uh, other I think it's important to start the conversation because my, uh, the reason I started teaching the course was I have to do it. The reason I developed a course on mindfulness and social justice was nothing available. So I need to really think through this question. Um, mindfulness as a, as a tool is a very popular tool as a self-enhancement tool. So it's really good for you. It improves your memory, all kind of, it's all true empirically. They're very good. You'll hear the speakers coming, very excellent empirical work to show that. But well, for what for? What is the next level? It's how to take it? So that really, it also depends on the individual what they want to do, right? So it's really um, the, um, how they can transform it. One way I do it concrete, make it more concrete to my class is one of the final projects my students do is they have to design a mindful organization. However they want to define it, they can do it. But they have to come up with a vision statement and they have to write a passion statement why they are doing this. And they have to give a structure of the organization, what specific problem, social problem it's going to solve or any issue they are interested in. Then how they are going to engage, make sure the institutional practices use anything from here or they can read, how they're going to transform it. And as a leader, as a mindful leader, how they're going to work on it. And what are their strengths and what are the shortcomings they need to work on. So they have this explicitly, it's a very structured uh, activity. So it's very interesting, so students really engage with it, they really use it in a very creative way. Uh, some of them came up with a very original entrepreneurial ideas. One student came up with a plan, um, bring homeless dogs to homeless shelter, how to pair them and how to take them as an organization, how we can provide this service, things like that. So he really wants to work with that particular community. And there are a lot of interest in people who want to do things like that. So what I'm saying is, it's also important for them to help them to give the tools to imagine it. So whereas a lot of the critique of mindfulness really provide the criticism, but what to do with it after that? So I'm trying to engage with that question. So what can you do? It's not perfect, but I'm actually starting. So all the based on my field experience, these are things I think is useful. It's a good start, so people have different ways of doing it. So it, it's, it's at least a way to engage, provide them tools, there's possibilities we can think about it. Otherwise, people typically are just connected to the self-enhancement tool. That's a popular association with that. So I, I tell my students, you come, you learn, I also teach them the techniques in the class. Not that I don't teach them the techniques. But I said, this is not the only thing you're going to do in the class. So how do you use it? So you need to think beyond how your connection to others. Sometimes it's just, they even expand their connection to their friends and relatives in a way. This, the, the self is a little more transcendent, so not just focusing on them. So the, I've seen that in their diaries and all the journals they write for the class. Yes. I think it's, uh, it will be helpful to them, not only to recognize it, and also how to deal with this sort of a negative immediate response is, oh my gosh, when I do an IIT, uh, Implicit Association Test, I realize I'm a, I'm a racist, I'm a sexist. I, so how to deal with it? A lot of times people have difficulty dealing with it. So it provides tools to really think through this. So hopefully the Mindful Mindset Framework provide them some more, uh, more teeth to how to think about this question. Whereas the mindful, mindfulness practices just as a self-enhancement tool don't address these questions. So I'm really trying to add the piece to the main, main mainstream research. That's how we see it. Thank you so much for your talk. I have a question. Uh, sure. I'd love to hear your qualitative experiences. So first, do you believe that the mindful mindset um, would be helpful in helping um, people with multiple in intersectional components, like, say, poor people of color who don't have options for, for immigrants of color, right? Lots of different intersectional aspects in helping to um, overcome what I think it's, is it, what Cornell West calls like, like black nihilism. Obviously it's not, it's not black, but he calls it black nihilism. Um, and if so, what experiences have you seen 
qualitatively working with disadvantaged communities? Um, This, uh, some, the, the experience, the, my qualitative experience mostly with my students come from very different backgrounds, very different, because I teach the session where almost half my course is students come from very uh, underprivileged background of my students are. Um, how they take it and what, they do, what they're dealing with it, sometimes they take it just to deal with some personal issues they have, addiction, to all, so they really think this is what's going to help me, so they really work on that. Some really take it to really um, take the idea for self-care. So I'm an activist. I'm not taking care of myself. So I need to do self-care. So they really focus on self-compassion. So they really take different pieces from it, depending on what the needs are, or where at what stage they're actually involved with this. So, so I really find different ways people take these ideas, depending on what the needs are. Um, some people look on, work on. Uh, Specific question, how to deal with uh, racism in workplace? How to deal with it? So they really take this and think about this question. And again, so it's very specific, at least based on my students' experiences, each of them have their own way of thinking about it, the tools. And some questions are more important to them than the other questions. So in fact, even they're looking at in the classroom and we discuss it, they all come up with a very different what they foreground as the question they want to address. So I give them as a, as a toolbox. One way I think about it is they use a toolbox and they pick something they want. And sometimes they also say the package should be good. We should have it. But I'm going to use this for this. Right? That's really, that's one way they really use that. So what I'm saying is much more contextual. I really want them to really think of it as a way to really help them think through the question, specific question they're interested in or the issue is important to them.